Welcome back to another edition of Hollenbeck Unleashed and today's hot topic for discussion is hyperinflation and of course I'm joined by Dr Frank Hollenbeck. Good afternoon Frank. Good afternoon. Now hyperinflation, at the moment there's growing fears that current monetary expansion will lead to hyperinflation. Now we've got a quote from Voltaire, a famous French philosopher who says paper money eventually returns to its intrinsic value zero. What exactly was Voltaire talking about here and how does it relate to, to the present day? Well, uh, since the creation of the Federal Reserve System, uh, the dollar has lost 98% of its value. And uh, the reason it's lost 98% of its value is that we've had uh, periods of inflation and very high inflation in the United States. And let me say something about inflation. It's a bit like being on a sailboat and everything is fine, you have a light wind, and you turn a peninsula and you get the ocean breeze that picks up the sails, and if you're not careful, it'll throw you into the ocean. And what we've seen with inflation is that it can pick up very quickly. Uh, for example, in uh, 1915, inflation was 1%. By 1916, it was 7%. Uh, in 1945, it was uh, 2%. And by 1947, it was 14%. And we all know the inflation experience we had in the 70s, where in 72, it was relatively mild, and it went 11% by 74. And it stayed in double digits or very high rates of inflation throughout the 70s. So the thing about inflation, is uh, going around the peninsula is basically how uh, inflation expectations change. And if inflation expectations change, then inflation can pick up relatively quickly. Now let's go on to discuss one or two of the worst episodes of hyperinflation in history. We've got Germany, perfect example, one of the most famous ones after World War I, 1920s. But what about the French hyperinflation in the 1800s? Now that took almost, or over I should say, 40 years for a full recovery. Tell me a little bit more about that one. That's a very interesting episode because it has a lot of implications to what's happening today. Uh, it actually occurred between 1790 and 1797. And at the time, France was on a silver and gold standard. And the government, because it was running large uh, budget deficits and had a large debt, uh, sounds familiar. Of course. <laughs> uh, it decided that it needed to find a way to finance this. And it was going to issue uh, basically paper currency. Uh, and this paper currency was backed by uh, the land that the government had expropriated from the church. And this land was actually some of, it was about a third of France and it was located in the best locations. Now this um, new currency was going to pay interest to 3%. And they were going to issue about 400 million uh, of these uh, units, 400 units of what it was called the assignat, that was the name of the currency. Now at the time there was a lot of opposition to the issues of this paper currency. France had experienced in the 1720s a period of hyperinflation under John Law and so a lot of people remembered the disastrous effects of the hyperinflation that occurred just 70 years before. Also France had a lot of the brightest financial minds of the time. Uh, these weren't people who didn't know the consequences of issuing currency. But ultimately, uh, the paper currency was issued and uh, the economy picked up. But within five months, uh, the government ran out of money again. And there was a, a, a desire to issue more paper currency. And the initial argument was, well, you know, the land is worth a lot more than 400 million, so we can issue more money. Okay? And the debate was even stronger stronger during the second issuance. In other words, there was really very, very strong opposition. And the second issuance almost didn't occur because of the, the large opposition that existed at the time. Now, the way they were able to pass the second issuance, they, were, they said that if we sell land and we get paid, we're going to basically burn this currency. So in other words, we'll take this currency out of circulation. Now, what happened is um, uh, when this second issuance was put into the system, prices started to rise. And as prices started to rise, what happened is people asked, well, there was a greater and greater demand for money. People said, we don't have enough money to conduct transactions. So very quickly, the government reneged on its promise to burn the money when people purchased the land. Now, although the first two uh, issuance of paper money was relatively difficult, it became easier and easier to print new money. 
And uh, what happened is each time uh, the economy improved and we went and had uh, what I call boom and bust cycles. But what happened is that we needed more and more money to be printed and the boom periods became shorter and shorter. At the time we had people saying that inflation was prosperity. Each time we had a new issuance of money, a bit like uh, a drunkard uh, after uh, uh, a night out, okay, forgetting that uh, the price he's going to have to pay is going to be the uh, hangover that he's going to have uh, the next morning. Now, what happened is that uh, with this boom and bust cycles, we had a lot of businesses go bankrupt. For example, the very large um, industrial base in Normandy uh, basically closed shop. And the government, uh, instead of looking at the real cause of these shutdowns, blamed foreigners. And ultimately, they imposed uh, tariffs and quotas, which basically made uh, the city situation even worse. Now, one of the interesting things and how it relates to today is that it changed society. In other words, instead of people going out and making real goods and services, people found that the best way to make money was to be basically a speculator or a gambler. Okay? And also we had a situation where everybody, very quickly with this hyperinflation situation, very quickly we got a very large class of debtors because it's debtors who gain if we have high inflation. And and it's creditors who lose. So very quickly, in a very, very short period of time, society changed where we got a very large class of individuals who benefited from the hyperinflation. And as they got more and more money, they got more and more power and they were able to influence the politics and there was enormous amount of corruption at the time. And because they were able to influence the politics, they were able to ensure that the hyperinflation would continue. Now, um, what happened is that this system continued until about 1797, the beginning in 1797. And ultimately in 1797, money had, the paper money was totally worthless. It came to the intrinsic value of zero, as Voltaire said. And they actually took the printing presses and took them out to the Place Vendôme in Paris, and they actually destroyed them. And at the same time, they said that the paper was no longer legal, legal currency. Now. Um, afterwards, Napoleon took over uh, the situation and he took over a situation where France was uh, essentially almost bankrupt and he turned things around and he followed a very simple rule. Okay? And his quote is that I will pay cash or I will pay nothing. Okay? And he was able to turn uh, the French finances around. He also was uh, indemnably influenced by uh, what happened during this period. He said, while I live, I will never resort to irredeemable paper or a paper currency system. And um, that kind of summarizes what happened between 1790 and 1797. Now, if we bring it back to present day, for example, the U.S. economy. Now, Ben Bernanke, the Federal Reserve Chairman, recently said how higher gasoline prices may push up prices in the short term, but not in the long term. He said the central bank will continue to monitor energy markets carefully. Its longer term expectations appear consistent with the view that inflation will remain subdued. Now, there are some economists out there that even fear of hyperinflation in the US due to the scale of monetary easing and debt creation. They think that the US dollar is heading towards hyperinflation in 2014. What's your view on this? Is it likely that we could see hyperinflation in the US? Well, Bernanke several times has indicated that he doesn't see any inflation, nor does he see uh, any expectations of inflation. And if we look at the yield curve, he's right. But the thing is, is that you don't wait until inflation uh, before you deal with it. Uh, inflation is a bit like a sunburn. You don't wait until you s your skin is red to uh, deal with uh, the, the problem. You deal with the problem before you leave your apartment. And the same thing is true about inflation. Uh, I think we're making a mistake today. I think we're kind of just waiting for inflation to pick up. I think we probably should have... Um, we should have tightened monetary policy maybe a year ago. I've always said that all this money into the system is fine, but I said, what happens if things start getting back to normal? And we may be seeing things start to get back to normal okay, in the United States, is will the U.S. be able to pull out the money that it's put into the system? Well, that's a million dollar question, isn't it? It is. Well, Frank, thank you very much for coming into the studio. We'll have more Hollenbeck Unleash next week, but in the meantime, we'll have plenty of exclusive interviews on Duke's Copy TV, so do stay tuned. Goodbye for now.